the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, Tyson, my friend, I'm excited about our guest today. I'm excited to be with you. I feel like we haven't recorded in a while, so I think it's going to be a great show. I agree. Are you in D.C. still? No, I'm in St. Louis. I'm just on dad duty driving the Norinator to tennis camp for her week-long tennis camp. She's really come to like it. Very cool. I love it. All right, well, let's go ahead and get in with our guest. Our guest is Rita Long. She is the happier attorney, which I love how she calls herself the happier attorney. The, and she's the author of the book, The Happier Attorney, a comprehensive guide to charging flat fees for legal services. Uh, she coaches attorneys on how to use flat fees as well as mindset and intuition. Brita, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Brita, why don't you start off by telling us, I mean, you are a, an attorney yourself. Why don't you tell everyone sort of your, your story, your journey from law school till, till the present? Well, I uh, went to ASU uh, Law School and graduated in 97 and uh, moved to the Seattle area. And my first job didn't take, I was in the middle of nowhere, but my real first job was as a deputy prosecuting attorney in the Pacific Northwest and did that for a couple of years and looked around and saw what people were doing on their own. And I had always wanted to go out on my own. That, That had always been my intention. And so I, with, uh, I think I had $3,000 saved and a borrowed computer. I went out on my own in 2000, practicing family law. And uh, it's it's been a while. I did the empire building thing where I uh, had the big office and associates and the whole nine yards. And uh, in 08, 09, when the economy crashed, so did I. It was just too much. And I went back down to simple. And that is what works for me. And I transitioned from family law to estate planning. And then what about three years ago, three and a half years ago, my father was not doing well health wise. And him living in downtown Seattle in my house was not going to work well. And he was going to need to live with me. So we, I, and the intention was he would move as well, moved to Texas. And I had grown up in the sun and I needed sun back and came down to Texas and started writing. And I loved writing. Just add, I found my gig with writing and that is what I've been doing and teaching other attorneys how to use flat fees and trying to teach what I've learned in 20 plus years of having my own practice and learning from other attorneys and, and calling things as they are. (laughs) Let's put it that way. I found that there was a lack of not integrity per se, but not calling out elephants in the room. And all of the attorneys that I knew were going through the same thing, but we didn't talk about it. We didn't share our struggles. And then that doesn't help solve any problems. So that is, that is what I do now is coach attorneys and teach and um, try to have attorneys 
get a little bit more honest with themselves about what is working, what isn't working, and so that they can be happier. So that's the short version of it. So, Brita, you said something really interesting, um, and you, you were talking about the you know, empire building versus then making it a little more simple. Do you think that that's a pretty common thing where people think that they want to build the empire, but then they realize, oh, my gosh, I, I need to be th- this needs to be more simple to be happier. But then they keep going down the path of build of empire building. Absolutely. And for at least for me, at least and for others that I talk to, we think that's what we're supposed to do. Like if you want to grow and it's especially if you are in more of a business mindset, if you recognize If you have a practice, you have a business. That means you're an entrepreneur, which some attorneys don't realize. But for those who do, then everything that you read and now everything online and is to grow, grow, grow. And on paper, it sounds great. On paper, it works out, especially when you're getting burned out, especially when you're overworking, getting burned out. It seems like a simple solution. Well, I will just hire some associates. They'll do all of the work. I will manage the practice. I pay them X. I charge over X. We, it, we all walk away happy, right? It's the perfect solution. Well, it's not for a lot of people. And um, if anyone has ever tried to manage attorneys, they would know it's, <laughs> it really is easier to hurt cats a lot of the time. So, but, but we think that's what we're supposed to do. And we don't think many times, we don't do the introspection of, is this even really what I want? Or is this my ego getting in the way? And not egotistical, but my ego of, oh, you're supposed to want the big firm. You're supposed to want the fancy. You're supposed to want to have the prestige that growing a firm gives you, whether that's actually fits you or not is another question. What effect do you think that the pandemic has had on people's willingness to think that an empire building scenario is not the best thing for them? Oh, I, I don't know the answer to that specific question, but I think in general, the pandemic has been good for people to take a step back and do some soul searching as to what do I really want? And it certainly has shaken up all of the old, well, you can't do that. You have to have an office. You know, you can't work remotely. Well, clearly we can. Where, you know, years ago, even I would say even three or four years ago, the common thought, at least in my circle of people that I knew was, you know, if you didn't have an office, it was subpar. Right. I mean, were you a real attorney if you didn't have an office and staff and eh. and that obviously has been switched on its head. So I think people are examining all of the rules that we have as attorneys of what makes us attorneys. How do we work? How do we not work? And some of those very stringent unspoken rules, I think, are getting blown out of the water, which I don't think is a bad thing. So as far as empire building, I hope people are looking back. And and if people want an empire, have at it. Have at it. As long as they are honest about it and have done that real soul searching and, and understand what it takes. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. And be willing to do that. I, I've talked to so many attorneys who want to build an empire. And I'm like, do you do you like managing people? Well, no. Well, I'll just hire somebody to do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, so if you go through all of what it really is going to entail, then, and if you still want it, great. But I, I do think that the pandemic is, has caused people to take a step back and really examine what they want in life. Yeah. If you, if you don't like managing people, you definitely don't need to be uh, building an empire because it's built upon people. So it's, right. it's definitely not what you want. And, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, client expectations. I think you're right. I think the pandemic, I don't think it's completely changed it, but it, it definitely has allowed, you know, clients and other attorneys to reassess and say, oh, you know what, maybe 
maybe this is not necessary. The expectations of an actual office aren't as much. I mean, a lot of the communication has been done via Zoom and phone call over the last 18 months. I, I think you're right about that. But let's segue into the happier attorney. So tell us about this and what's the inspiration for this? Well, I had used flat fees for a long time and I'd use them in family law. I'd use them in heavy litigation family law. And at the time, I was the only family law attorney that I had known in Washington, certainly in Seattle and the surrounding areas who used flat fees. And they worked very well for me. It took me a couple of years to figure it out and make the mistakes. And those mistakes are costly, but I love them. I absolutely love them. And when I was starting to write, I really had a choice of, okay, I can start practicing again and build that all up, which is fine. Or I can do something else. And I was surrounded with people who were doing courses, which I'd never even heard of, quite frankly, video courses and such. And I was like, wow, I could do that. And then, of course, the fear comes in of, well, who would ever pay me to teach them flat fees? It's so easy. Well, yeah, it's easy after you've been doing it 15 years. And I took a chance. And sure enough, people really are interested in flat fees. And it is very important to learn how to do them properly because they are a very powerful tool that if you don't use them properly, you will get burned badly. And what I found in my intention was just to start teaching flat fees, but almost immediately it turned into so much more, so much more mindset issues and intuition, listening to your intuition, learning how to recognize it and then listen to it and trust it. And this work with flat fees has just opened a wonderful Pandora's box in with attorneys having an outlet to express their feelings. And it's not woo-woo. It really isn't. But again, to examine what they're doing in their practice, is it working? Because to use flat fees really well, you need to be able to communicate well with your clients, which a lot of attorneys don't do. You need to have healthy boundaries with your clients, which a lot of attorneys don't do. I didn't either. For years. And that takes more than just learning the one, two, threes of flat fees. That takes a lot of internal work. So that's what I do with my clients. But uh, it, I don't think that flat fees are the answer to everything in our profession, As and our profession is pretty unhappy. I don't think anyone would argue that. But it goes a long way. It goes a long way to improving your well-being as an attorney and burnout rate and being able to just come back to why you got in the profession in the first place, just to come back to doing your work and not getting paid for your minutes. Have you heard? Max Lacan is back live and in person this fall at the Ameristar Casino Resort and Spa in St. Charles, Missouri. We can't wait to gather with hundreds of you to reunite with OG Maximum lawyers and finally meet the newer community members. This event is for you if you're searching for the best ways to scale your law firm and you're craving connections with like-minded legal entrepreneurs. Max Khan 2021 has a full day exclusive Guild Member Mastermind Day on Monday, October 11th, with the two-day general conference on Tuesday, October 12th and Wednesday, October 13th. These two days will be full of actionable, proven, strategic content from experts that have been in your shoes. There's no conceptual thought or theoretical strategies behind any of these sessions. Everything you hear at MaxLawCon 2021 are tested, proven tactics to get more clients and maximize your firm. That's why we put people on stage who have actually done it. Hear the latest ideas, strategies, and insights from our speakers. To learn more and grab your ticket today, head to maxlawcon.com. You're listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Our guest today, Rita Long, she's an expert attorney on the issue of flat fees. She's trying to revolutionize the way we lawyers handle our billing. And Rita, give us some basic groundwork on how to sort of set the fees. You know, I mean, and we do everything on a flat fee. I'm an immigration lawyer. We do everything on a flat fee and I love it. And I remember early on getting some resistance from other lawyers 
because they said there's going to be some clients that take up all your time and all your money. But in my mind, I just try to see if it, if it ends up a wash. If one client ends up taking too much time and others don't, then in my mind, it all sort of balances out in the, the benefits of the flat fee and not having to bill the client and invoice them and all that stuff is just so much better. Yeah. A friend of mine, Regina, says any issues that attorneys have with flat fees are not a flat fee issue. They're an attorney issue. And I completely agree. And that's one of the concerns that attorneys bring up. In my experience, the issues with flat fees do not happen half as much as attorneys think they will. But when they do come up, that's the attorney issue. That issue that you just described, that's a client boundary issue. So if you are having clear communication and expectations with your clients from the get-go of this is how I work, this is what constitutes an emergency, this is what doesn't, I want you to call me when there's an issue, but I don't want you to call me when, you know, every day if there's not, and you enforce those boundaries, and you can do that politely, then clients, it's very rare when they really push it. And if we're being honest with ourselves, every client that I have had that there was a boundary issue where I really had to dig my heels in, you know, I knew that from the get-go. That is a client that looking back, I knew from from the get-go that, oh, this person's going to be a problem. And either you charge accordingly, and with flat fees, you can do that, where you can say, okay, this this client's going to need more hand-holding. So I'm going to charge more for that. And in in the case that something happens and it really blows up, that is unexpected, which every, you know, once in a blue moon will happen, when you're using flat fees, you don't care. You really don't care because overall, you are working far less. You're not overworked. You're making more money. Your life is simple. And so if, you know, once every few years, a client takes up, or a case takes up more time than you expected, but you're making 200, 300 more than you were, and you're working 35, 40 hours a week, as opposed to 50 or 60, who cares? Right? I mean, you really don't. It, it absolutely washes out. So, Brita, do you have an opinion on whether or not attorneys should publish their fees, for example, like on their website or in bro- brochures or anything like that? Well, I'm an attorney, so the answer is going to be it depends. I mean, you know, what did you expect? I I do. I think it really depends if, you know, part of flat fees, the, the beauty of it is that when you can adjust for each case. And so if you publish your fees, then people are going to expect that. And so if you say, you know, a, a dissolution cost between this and that, and somebody comes in, Jeff Bezos comes in, well, clearly the fee that you publish is not going to be appropriate, right? Well, you're going to have to explain that to the client of, yeah, those fees on the website, uh uh-uh, no. And you're going to have to explain why that might be awkward. And if you're starting out, I would absolutely not publish any fees whatsoever because part of starting out is experimenting and figuring out the sweet spot. So I would err on not publishing. I do see the beauty of if you are starting your dissolution, say your your smallest, you wouldn't take anything under 10 grand. If you're getting a lot of people that that is out of their range, well, you don't want to have them come in and think that they can hire you and then not. However, I think if you're charging for an initial consultation and you're charging well for that, that gives them a pretty good signal as well that, oh, this, this person is going to be a little higher. So I would err on not publishing personally. I know that other attorneys who use flat fees disagree on that. So that's what I'll say. I think there's other ways that you can cue in a potential client that the price is going to be a little higher. When I think about flat fees, I think about when Tyson and I first met, I was teaching a class at St. Louis University Law School on law firm management. And one of our first guest speakers was a, a guy who's been around for a really long time and been in the tech space. His name's Dennis Kennedy. And he told a story about how in the old days, he, he worked at a really big firm and they would do things on an hourly basis, including estate plans, which I think is one of the most amenable 
practice areas to flat fees, but they would do it on an hourly basis. You can believe that. And he would write out the, the will or the estate plan. He would give it to his secretary who would make all the edits and then he'd get it back. She'd, she'd type it up again on a typewriter. He would edit it and she'd get it back and they'd do it like three or four times. And then he started getting into word processing. So that's even before computers, but he, he figured out a way to script out a basic will and it cut his time by 80%. And right. he was completely he was completely freaked out because he thought he was doing away with his business model. And then it dawned on him eventually that what he's really selling is his expertise, not his time looking at red ink marks and making edits. Exactly. And that's the beauty of flat fees is you are getting paid for your judgment. You are getting paid for your work product. You're getting paid for results. And I know we can't guarantee results, but your focus changes with flat fees on what are you actually providing for your client? Why is your client here in the first place? They're not here to get some documents. They're here to get peace of mind. They're here to get a divorce as quickly as possible, unless there's a strategic reason not to. Uh, They're here to get out of this or to, again, have that peace of mind that, you know what, that contract, it might not be bulletproof, but it's as good as it's going to get. They don't care how long you took to do something. That would, I mean, and, and this is people, attorneys think that flat fees are just so, they're so scared of them. This is how we buy something every day of our lives. This is how we buy everything every day. It's no different. You know, if you hire someone to replace your roof, you care if it took two days or four days. Actually, it's better if it took two days, right? Because that's two days that you have them out of your lives and out of your house and all of the rest. That's how clients think as well. They, they don't care how long something took. It's better for their life for it not to take as long, generally. So... You know, that's a pretty solid point. I I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it like that. I think that's actually a a pretty solid point, the way we look at it as consumers, for sure. Before we start to wrap things up, Brita, I wanted to see, do you have any advice on people on how they can set those actual flat fees? Well, I do. And and, but it's not appropriate for this context. And that might sound self-serving, but flat fees are like an entire recipe. And you have to know the entire recipe before you say, well, how much salt do you put in it? Because people ask all the time, well, what do you charge for this? I can't tell you that because that's like asking, well, how much salt do I put in that recipe? I don't know. I don't know how many people you're feeding. I don't know the other ingredients of the recipe. I don't even know where you're making it, which factors in. So it is all encompassing. But essentially, you are, if you are practicing, you're looking back at old cases to see if you have tracked time, which I can tell you, most attorneys that I talk to are horrible about tracking their time. It's like the Clio study that had attorneys averaging two hours a day that they're getting paid for, which is absurd, which is if there's no other reason to use flat fees, that's it. But it's looking back and seeing how much this case actually cost because we underestimate in our heads. And if you just start using flat fees with no basis, with no research, it's going to take longer and you're going to underestimate. I have never had an attorney overestimate a fee ever, ever. So you're going to underestimate. And if, if something's supposed to really cost 10,000 and you charge two, you're still doing $10,000 worth of work. And then you come back and say, well, flat fees don't work. But you are looking at how much time it's going to take. But that's just one factor, one factor. You're looking at the complexity involved. How much expertise do you have? Maybe it takes you 10 minutes because you've been doing it 20 years, right? Are you, do you have some special thing that you're bringing? Do you have some special knowledge that you're bringing to that case? special relationships that you're bringing that help your client. And you're basing your fee on all of even down to your client. Is this going to be a person that needs more handholding? Who's opposing counsel? If you know, we all know those opposing counsel that you're like, oh, geez, 
Well, with flat fees, you're going to be charging more for that because it is more work. It is more of a pain in the rear. So you're going to be charging for that. And where you are, of course, if you're in rural South Dakota, you're not going to charge what you charge in LA. And you set it and you monitor. Okay, was that too low in the beginning? I can tell you it's probably going to be too low. And the, the sweet spot for flat fees is a, in between a little excited and a little scared. If you're setting a fee and you don't have any butterflies in your stomach about it, it's probably too low, at least in my experience with attorneys. Again, I think I've even heard of one or two attorneys that would overcharge, but really it's all encompassing. You have to treat it like a recipe and have all of the ingredients. I'm glad you brought up the topic of opposing counsel because, I mean, one thing that our friends in the contingency fee field always talk about are these insurance defense firms that want to bill out the wazoo and do everything hourly. But I'm thinking too about my friend, Jim McMullen. He's a family law attorney and he came down the hall and said to me one day, Jim, I just finished a divorce in which I did every single thing possible that you would ever have to do in a divorce. My legal fee was 16000 and the opposing attorney's legal fee was 60000 so how do you, you, obviously you can't pick your opposing counsel and sometimes you have to set your fee ahead of time. How does it come into play when you're talking about adversaries who are incentivized to drag things out and bill out the butt? Yeah, I can just talk to my experience. My experience was that those were pretty few and far between. So again, when you're looking at big picture, when you get those cases, you really don't care because you're doing so much better than you were that it's not that big of a deal. But when that happens, then you are going to have your timeframes involved so that there is an end date to the bleeding. So you're not just hemorrhaging forever. There's an end date where if the case isn't completed, you're going to be having a conversation with your client of, I'm going to need more money. We didn't get done. You, you can see why we didn't get done. But the beautiful thing about flat fees is that you've already been paid and you've been paid well and your focus is on the case. And all I can tell you is my experience, you don't care. You just don't. I had one case that a family law case where the opposing side hired a new attorney. The first attorney was reasonable and the, the client didn't like that. The opposing party didn't like that. And he got someone who's not. Uh, we never had depositions in Seattle. This guy scheduled, I think it was nine. He deposed two preschool teachers. I mean, it was just absurd. I mean, he was just churning for the sake of churning. And it was so clear and obvious to everybody. And his client didn't care. His client had a war chest and didn't care. Well, my client did have to pay more because we had the time frame where we should have been done. We weren't going to be done. She knew why. And so I did get paid an additional fee, but really those cases are few and far between. And my focus was on the case, not, oh, this is going to cost my client more. Can my client pay more? Oh, that, that deposition, shoot my client. That's going to be another whatever for my client. You just go in and you do your job, which you do a better job, quite frankly. So it's going to happen, but you do have stop gaps in your fee that prevent a lot of it. But every once in a while, one gets through Somebody, and you don't care. You just go in and protect your I, client and do your job. I think what you just said was really, really important about the stop gaps. I think that that is absolutely crucial and having the right agreements in place is what really protects you when it comes to flat fees. And I haven't done flat fees in years, but I had them whenever I was in criminal defense and the, the stop gaps were, are definitely the things that saved me whenever I did do them. But Frida, we do have to wrap things up. So I, I could probably have this conversation a, a lot because for a very long time, because I actually enjoy having like, talking about this, this side of things. But uh, I do want to wrap things up before I do. I want to remind everyone to go to the Facebook group, get involved there. There's a lot of great activity, getting close to 5,000 members. So a lot of people in that group. If you're interested in the Guild, go to maxlawguild.com. And then if you want to go to the conference, hurry up and get your tickets. As our most recent email said, run, don't walk, because the tickets are going to sell out soon. Jimmy, what is your hack of the week? So some of our friends in the Guild, Elise Bowie and Paul Yokobitis, have tuned me in to a guy named David Nagel. He has a podcast called The Successful Mindset Podcast. I'm really enjoying it, and I highly recommend it. 
I like his podcast. Here's what I'll say. One caveat. It's daily and it is a lot to consume. So, but he does have some really good stuff, really high level stuff. So I, I agree. It's a really good podcast. Brita, we always ask our guests, guests to give a tip or a hack of the week. It could be a book, could be a podcast, could be anything. Do you have a tip or a hack for us? Well, uh, I just released, I have a podcast and, and as self-serving as it may sound, we just yesterday released an episode with Mark Chen, who is a family law attorney in Jackson, Mississippi. He's been practicing, uh, I tease him, you know, he's been practicing since the earth cooled. I would absolutely not only listen to that podcast, but uh, he has books out on the ABA website, Mark Chin. And just if you want to really learn your craft and not have it based on all of these new strategies, but learn your craft, I would start reading his books. And he also has an ebook on flat fees called Dump the Billable Hour. So that's my tip. Start following uh, Mark Chin in practice. Be Mark Chin and you'll have a pretty successful career. I like it. Very good. Very good advice. So for my tip of the week, it actually comes, I'm going to take a a tip that Guild member John Ting gave to me and Jim last night. And it is actually kind of cool because people are talking about answering services all the time. They're talking about VAs all the time. Well, he found a service. Go to getwingapp.com and it is VA services and answering services for flat fees all repped into, repped into one, uh, which is kind of a cool idea. He's actually testing it out. I went to the website. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about tinkering with it, but I told him he needs to mess around with it and, and test it out first and then I'll try it out. But I think it is in, it's an interesting concept. I think, it's, I think it's especially appropriate maybe for smaller projects, not necessarily a higher end stuff. If you need like paralegal help, I don't think it's good for that. But I think it's something cool to try out. So uh, it's something similar to what Jay Ruwain had recommended a while ago, magic, I think. But what makes it different is that it does have that component where they answer the phone as well, which is kind of cool. So that's my tip of the week. Uh, Brita, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. I think this is a conversation that a lot of people need to have. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Brita. Have a great day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Have a great week and catch you next time.